Thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Uh, it, it's, it's great to be invited uh, and to have such an amazing experience here. But there really is something that we do need to talk about. Um, it's a condition that's lethal. It accounts for one in a hundred deaths. It's indiscriminate and anyone can be affected. It affects three times more men than women. It can affect children. It mostly affects people of working age, thus robbing them of useful quality life years. It kills more young people than cancer. It kills more middle-aged people than accidents. It's the leading cause of death in men under 50, and it's the commonest cause of death in new mothers. Most people in this room will have been affected by it. I, too, have had professional experience and in my extended family. The impact on those people affected is enduring, and they, too, will become at increased risk. The condition we need to talk about is suicide. So, suicide accounted for almost 5,000 deaths in England in 2015. That's 13 per day. If all of these planes had crashed in a year, someone would be perhaps thinking something needed to be done. So where is the public outcry? Where is the demand for more research, for better treatments? It, it, it doesn't seem to come forward. Um, and I think the clamour that for something must be done is coming. Um, I think there are reasons why uh, th th this, hasn't, this, this outcry hasn't happened enough. I think that people feel, people affected by suicide often feel stigma and shame. Quite a lot of people believe there's absolutely nothing that could be done. And those people that believe that there's something that could be done don't actually think it's them that needs to do it. So, um, in addition, uh, there's those views that are understandable about people having a right to make that ultimate decision. Well, that's fair enough. Um, but, but really, whatever you believe about that, when people want to die, it's often because they want the pain to end, not because they actually want to die. So I think that people bereaved by suicide are changing the world. Um, these are some people I've come across in my travels um, who've spoken about their experiences. What they do is tell a compelling story. They come out from the, the shadows, the silence, the stigma, um, and they give communities and services an opportunity to learn. This is actually tremendously helpful. Um, as what, as an, another uh, bereaved family spoke last week at a conference, uh, they said, you know, we're not just the dots on a graph. And I, I think that's very um, important. In addition, as well as those people who are bereaved, and I just probably should acknowledge Andy talking earlier, um, you know, this is a brave thing to do, but it does actually bring a motivation to, to do something. The other group of people who are... Oh, and sorry. People, these are people who've actually started to become part of strategies around suicide and affect policy. So Hamish Elvidge has actually offered a quote to the, uh, one of the national suicide prevention strategies. And it really just... Ha when you see those numbers and then read this uh, quote, I think it's really difficult to say everything's fine and nothing can be done. But the other group of people who are really important to us and can help us in our quest are those people who survived suicidal acts. Now, there are a number um, in the UK. I'd suggest uh, organisations like State of Mind Sport um, and, uh, and others. But I'd just like to introduce you to Kevin Hines. Um, I actually bought my T-shirt from Kevin Hines' mail order, so um, that's, uh, that, that's where it came from. So here's Kevin I hope. Oh, no. Have we got Kevin? OK, here he is. So he'll introduce himself in a moment. He's quiet at first, and then he'll start to talk.
in 2000, the year 2000, I became so depressed within every week that I was spinning out of control. I decided that I had to die. And so that was the decision I made. I was going to go to the Golden Gate Bridge and jump off. I walked upon that bridge for, I would say, probably 30 to 40 minutes, crying my eyes out. You know, I was hoping that someone would come up to me and say, are you okay? Is something wrong? Can I help you? And I had made a uh, pact with myself that if anybody said that, I would tell them everything. I was so shameful that I couldn't speak out to anyone the pain I was in. Thus, I ended up leaping off that bridge. And at the moment of free fall, I said, God, please save me, I don't want to die. My dad always used to say to me, Kevin, you're in two feet of water and you're drowning, stand up. If you're in two feet of water right now, stand up, walk forward. It's okay to ask for help. Nobody can do it all by themselves. Nobody. First of all, I want to say to all of you soldiers out there deployed wherever you are deployed, thank you very much. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for all your service. We appreciate it. Second, I'd like to say if you are thinking, if, if you have an inkling of suicidal thought or ideation, if you're thinking of hurting yourself, Please understand that there is great help out there, and there is great hope out there. You can overcome these suicidal thoughts, because suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Thank you, Kevin. It's a compelling story, isn't it? So, uh, we put a man on the moon, um, and we've eradicated smallpox. When those things were planned, I'm sure there were a whole load of people who said that just can't happen. Are we ready uh, to set that ambitious goal for suicide prevention? The zero movement. Okay, so some people don't like zero. I'm happy to talk about that uh, at, at the end. Um, but Ed Kofi, a psychiatrist in Detroit, um, and I think uh, Greg did the trailer for this last year, um, managed to reduce suicide for two years to zero in a healthcare um, system, uh, the Henry Ford healthcare system. Um, and he did that through a program of perfect depression care. So, the South West England Zero Suicide Collaborative and Cornwall and Isles of Silly Towards Zero, which I've been involved with, um, has tried to take that a little further and move it into the community. So, in, um, in the South West, some 300 people um, representing 60 organisations have come together to work collaboratively, um, working and engaging with people who've been bereaved and people who have uh, lived experience of suicidal crisis um, and really trying to use their stories to provide mot motivation and momentum. Um, our sort of mantra is every life lost to suicide is one too many. The population there is about 5 million. Um, Cornwall has a population of closer to half a million. And the Cornwall Towards Zero replicated this concept with a smaller community. So far, we've had three large events with over 100 people and as many organisations and smaller project groups working in between in a collab collaborative way. So, well, why should we collaborate? Well, it's really, it's really easy to point the finger of blame at health services, very especially mental health services. But in reality, uh, people who have taken their own lives, only a third of them have had contact with psychiatrists or mental health services in the previous year. A further third will have seen their GP, but that might have been for a completely unrelated health problem. This leaves a third with no contact with health services at all. And it's really tempting, consider these three in... Um, isolation, that we have interventions that go to each one. But in fact, some community-based in uh, interventions are likely to actually impact on all three groups, thus just having better value. Um, these might include suicide awareness training and reducing access to means of suicide. There are real perceived barriers still between clinical interventions into, into health systems and public health interventions. That may not be the case here, but it certainly is where I'm from. And those need to be broken down. 
So what is a collaborative? Well, I guess um, it, it really provides a melting pot of ideas. Um, it feels a little bit like bringing people to talk about their ideas and experiences around a water cooler. Um, it, people can exchange those ideas, and solutions appear in unexpected ways. It seems to be around breaking down barriers. It seems to be about, around fostering mutual respect. I mean, these are quite unlikely partners that are all in the same room. So, um, before the Southwest Collaborative commenced, there were certainly pockets of good practice. Um, we had um, in Cornwall, we had a, a suicide liaison service uh, in the, in, on the left-hand side there. Um, Network Rail and the Samaritans have done some fabulous work on engaging uh, uh, the rail industry in suicide prevention, which is actually very expensive for them. Um, there's the uh, Lions Barbers Collective, a uh, talky barber who actually is providing support whilst he's giving uh, haircuts and shaves. Um, and the character on the bottom right is one of the psychiatrists that I work with, um, and he was one of the leading people in uh, setting up a, a regular monthly mental health phone-in. Um, more of later. So these are some of the things that have, um, have, have bubbled out from this uh, cauldron of ideas. Um, the Samaritans have a third-party referral service. Um, they have uh, the ability to uh, take a referral and call someone back. That can be really helpful when people are feeling very vulnerable and don't want to make a call themselves. And through learning about that, a range of organisations have actually taken that on and become linked with it. So um, the bottom uh, item is a letter of hope. That's been written by people who've survived mental health crisis. And the idea is it can be given out to people when they're feeling vulnerable. The um, cathedral service at the bottom, um, a service of reflection uh, and, uh, uh, and support for people who've been bereaved. Um, it was a very moving service. The second one was just this year. Um, and it was supported this time by a, a male voice choir who'd actually lost a member to suicide, so particularly poignant. Um, the um, the uh, card, this is a, a small how-are-you-really-feeling card that's uh, illustrated at the top, um, has actually arisen from conversations with people about how important it is not just to ask people how they are, but kind of ask them how they really are uh, and actually listen to the reply. Um, other things that have happened, uh, suicide awareness training, ASSIST, has been provided very specifically um, to police community support officers who support the farming community and is being planned for those that support um, hate crime, so vulnerable, particularly disadvantaged groups. Um, and uh, two of the people within the collaborative collaborated on some training for final year medical students because actually it's not something that's routinely trained to doctors uh, to, to assess somebody sympathetically and appropriately for suicide risk. And every specialty of medicine needs this training. Um, it is now on the GMC new curriculum, I'm pleased to say. So I'm going to talk about a project in Cornwall. This was an innovative project. Uh, involved my own organisation, the Mental Health Trust. It involved the Samaritans, Radio Cornwall, Public Health, who work for Cornwall Council, and a slightly surprising partner, a brewery. Um, this was around posters. I'll talk a little bit more about them. Uh, but the organisations that are coming across the screen are organisations who have displayed uh, the posters. Um, I'll just let those slide across. So a number of organisations, they were very popular. Um, and I, what I should say about the posters is that they're actually designed particularly for the male toilets. Because of this increased risk in men, um, the idea is that we might actually uh, find men at a time when their attention is undivided. So... <laughs> OK, uh, so this is a, an example of the three first posters. Um, the slogans were actually suggested by Radio Cornwall listeners. Um, and people actually offered their images. Uh, the, the, uh, the image on the right is a rugby coach with the Cornish Pirates. Um, the middle image is a public health doctor. Um, and the, the left is somebody who actually really does work in the bottling plant at St Hostel Brewery, who volunteered. Um, 
Many people who both offered the slogans and the images reported that the subject was particularly meaningful to them. They offered a caring message and suggestions of advice to seek help. One of the things that happened was that some of the posters were taken away. Um, they, they weren't vandalised or, or damaged. I think people actually took them away because of the phone number. We thought that was a sign of success. Um, this, is, uh, the, the, this is another of the posters, uh, and this is the radio presenter that does most of our mental health phone-ins. He's been a great supporter of suicide prevention work, um, and I've got a little clip of him just talking about the project. I present the lunchtime phone-in on BBC Radio Cornwall. We have an audience of about 100,000 daily who tune in. How I measure the success of this campaign is purely by the interaction from the audience. Two, three years ago, people would never talk about suicide. Now, when we hold phone-ins, they regularly phone in. They talk about the most intimate, darkest secrets live on air. And it's an incredible achievement to the listeners and the team to come up with this poster campaign that makes people feel comfortable talking to a live broadcaster. And I'm really hoping we can roll this sort of scheme out to other stations across Britain. This is Emma. She's our inquest solicitor. She has taken on the role uh, of giving the um, journalists that attend inquests a copy of the Samaritan's media guidelines. This is really important. The way that suicide is reported is a really important uh, health and safety issue. Um, and that's now being taken over by a new court witness service. So hopefully there will be no excuse for poor reporting at any time. And this is a great development. Um, Alex cont contacted us wanting to um, run an event for men with mental health problems um, as a result of a suicide loss of his, a friend of his. I'll just play it because it tells its own oh, story. I thought I'd just share with you... Um some thoughts and sort of reflections on, on how today went. Um, today was the event that we were fishing for positive mental health and uh, it's been great. We've been so lucky. The weather's, weather's, uh, weather's been really kind. It was, it was atrocious yesterday. I was a bit worried, but today's been brilliant. Um, we've welcomed along a number of guys who I think they've been brilliant. Um, I know for a lot of them, turning up today was really hard. Um, yeah, no, turning up today was, was really tough, uh, but so pleased um, that they did. And for many people, we either caught their very first fish or their first fish, at least for, for many, many years. Um, so really well done to all of you guys. Uh, well done to, to the guys at Roach Angling Club for, for being massively supportive. Big thanks to the Samaritans for coming along as well and being the support that you guys were. Um, and yeah, it's, we're just so lucky to have this this sport, this this day. It's ace, and just don't take any day for granted. And uh, thank you to everybody who who did the the liking and sharing on Facebook. It certainly was a method that talking to people that was that was how they found out about it. So really, really grateful for for all the work that you guys did as well. So, all right, thanks again. Cheers. So a ripple of suicide prevention. I'm on my last slide, I'm really sorry. OK, um, this lethal condition is not inevitable. Suicide prevention is a job for the whole community. Anyone can do something. Everyone has a role. We need to be ambitious. We need to start somewhere. So let's start a conversation. Let's talk about suicide and let's do it today. Thank you. <laughs>